Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, here in France, a hospital tries a novel approach to reach out to those women being affected by domestic violence. Also, where having your period means being forced to live in a hut despite the practice being outlawed in Nepal. It's still common in the country's far western regions. And bend it like Algeria, we take a look at the rise of women's soccer in the North African nation. But we begin here in France, where domestic violence remains the number one cause of death for women aged 16 to 44. Yet for many, it's hard to admit that their lives are indeed being affected. As a result, a hospital in the France northern city of blanc sur mer has taken a proactive stance to help victims both medically and legally. This report by France 24's Alexander Renard and Patrick Lovett. The emergency services of boulogne sur mers hospital. Not a day goes by without victims of domestic violence coming here to seek help. Domestic violence begins either in the emergency unit or sometimes, sadly, directly at the morgue. That's why we wanted the emergency services and the doctors to be close together. I'll show you around. Forensic pathologists, legal experts, psychologists. All these crucial services are located in this corridor. The medical team here no longer wants to be a passive witness of domestic violence by only healing the wounds. They want to fight it head on. We all work in the same place, so this helps us better coordinate when we're dealing with tough cases. There's no other way to really tackle domestic violence. Today's first abuse victim is only 14 years old. Dr. Prouveau is here to assist her. She specializes in cases where children are the direct target of domestic and sexual violence. She was only eight years old when the cycle of abuse began. Et donc quand il t'a emmené dans sa chambre, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé Est-ce que tu me souviens Bah, il me caressait. Mm -hmm. Et après, bah, c'était encore pire, quoi. Alors, c'était pire, c'était quoi, alors Bah, c'était encore pire. Mais à l'époque, tu, tu n'avais pas osé en parler à tes parents ou... Non, c'était carré avec mon frère. Ton frère t'avait fait aussi des violences, d'accord. On va aller faire l'examen gynécologique dans une autre salle. Quand on sera dans cette salle, au fur et à mesure, je vais t'expliquer comment ça va se passer et comment sera l'examen. Ça a été Oui. It's the first time this teenager undergoes an obstetrical examination. Each word, each move must be delicate. Alors là, je vais juste regarder pour regarder par exemple si est-ce que je vois des cicatrices. Voilà. Si je te pince ou si ça fait mal, il faut le dire. D'accord She's now accepting to speak up a bit more, however intimate and personal the topic. If this teenager hadn't already been supervised by another psychotherapist elsewhere, this is the office where she would have had to go next, a relay point of some sort, between the physical and psychological aspects of the victim's trauma. As soon as a victim has left the medical examiner, they come to my office or I go greet them directly in the hallway. This way we can talk it out. And victims know they also have backup and support at a psychological level. Hospital staff wearing lipstick, a symbolic imagery for a simple message. This place is fully dedicated to the service of women who suffer abuse. The personnel has been trained in detecting signs of violence. The idea was to involve personnel at all levels. Colleagues who serve meals, for example. They're trained to identify victims, the typical bruises, sadness. It's often in these moments they open up. They also learn how to tell the difference between types of bruises. Bruises caused by an intentional fall will leave a trace even in the sunken parts of the body. Case in point. Today, a nurse provided the first steps of guidance to such a victim. This 25-year-old woman came here for a routine pregnancy checkup. Aware of this hospital's reputation, and before her husband comes back to pick her up, she's now seeking help. 
Victims here benefit from medical and legal assistance anonymously and for free. When it first started, I really didn't think what I was experiencing had anything to do with violence. I thought this was the typical kind of crisis that all couples go through. But then it became so frequent. He would throw objects at me, insult me, verbal violence, one thing after the other. He caused me to quit my job, to stop seeing my friends. In my mind, I felt like I was in a trap. So right now, you don't really want to file a complaint. But in any case, I'm going to keep aside this medical certificate so you can use it as proof if you ever want to enter a legal procedure. You can contact me at any time. These medical observations, certificates, testimonies, DNA and other biological samples feed a never-growing database. Very useful work at both administrative and legal levels. But Dr. Provo's work does not stop here. She also travels to schools and NGOs to raise awareness on domestic violence and to promote her hospital's method of dealing with it. For her involvement, she was awarded the French Legion of Honor last year. What we're accomplishing here is an example to be followed, providing both medical care and legal backup to victims of domestic violence, building bridges between medical and legal services, like we do here. It's something women all across the country should be able to have access to. Indeed, today in France, only two hospitals provide such a service. In this country, domestic violence kills one woman every three days. To Dampahol now, where the practice known as Shapadi, which considers women untouchable when they menstruate, is still being carried out in the west of the country. As a result, women are banished from their homes each month and forced to sleep in basic huts. This despite the tradition being banned by the Nepalese Supreme Court more than 12 years ago. Alex Hurst has more. Despite the bitter cold, Pabitra will have to spend the night in a hut. She has her period, which means that she must leave home and isolate herself from her family. Now I'm used to it. I used to be afraid in the beginning because I was away from my family during dark nights and the places like this. Called Chaupadi, the ancient Hindu tradition forbids menstruating women from touching food, religious icons, cattle and men. This practice has technically been illegal in Nepal for a decade, but community elders and village shamans, who often fill a void left by poor local health care, want the tradition to continue. It's our tradition and culture. The gods become angry. It's not about individuals, but the gods that we worship, who ask women not to be near for those few days. Though Chaupadi is mainly followed in the country's rural western regions, even in the capital Kathmandu, 75% of homes place some restriction on women's activities during their periods. Recently, the deaths of two women, one from smoke inhalation, have spurred a push for stricter enforcement of the existing ban. We, we've seen that most women see Chaupadi and all menstrual restrictions not as an infringement of her rights, but more as an extension of the spiritual, of the role she plays as spiritual protector of the family or the religious protector of the family. And uh, that becomes a very difficult argument uh, to contest. A new bill would make it a jailable offense to force a woman into exclusion, but activists say such a law might be difficult to enforce. And finally, Algeria is not a country you may normally associate with women's soccer. But while it's still an amateur sport, the love for the beautiful game has trumped both gender stereotypes and even militant threats in the football-mad North African nation. Training for a League Cup game in Relizan, west of the Algerian capital. The Afak Relizan women's team was launched in 1997 during the country's civil war, back when armed Islamists prohibited all women's sports. But the team's coach and its players refused to be intimidated. I had a conversation with the players to ask them if they wanted to keep playing in spite of the threat. They decided to play on. 
They said if women took up arms during the war for independence, so could they. They wanted to fight that threat and keep playing. 26-year-old Fatia also plays for the national team, like five of the club's other players. The war may be over, but she says they still face social stigma in the conservative yet football-mad North African country. Everywhere in Algeria, people have a problem with women playing football. Sometimes when we're playing away and they see us in our football jerseys, they curse and insult us. But others are curious and ask questions. Like here in Relizan, they tell us that our success brings them pride more than the men's team. Some of the girls succumb to pressure to hang up their boots after marriage, but others are determined to play on. They tell us, why don't you get married? Why aren't you in the kitchen? A woman is made to stay in the kitchen. But I'm just playing football. I'm not doing anything wrong. Their words can't hurt me. I know I'm not doing anything wrong in the eyes of God. In recent years, the club's women's team has won multiple domestic and regional tournaments. Despite their runaway success, the players are unpaid and the club helps them find work on the side. They're awarded only $12 for every game won and few locals travel to games. The squad also has no sponsor or external financing, surviving only on passion for the beautiful game. I'm wishing them all the best. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please do keep those comments coming in. So until our next show, bye for now.